Greetings. My name's Victor Serino, and I'd like to welcome you to what is now my Masonic home, the Masonic Hall here in Southport, a seaside resort in the province of West Lancashire, some 25 miles from Liverpool on the coast. In some ways, this is a case of bringing the series of programmes up towards the present day, and I congratulate those of you who've gone the whole way thus far. I'd really like to pay tribute to the Grand Lodge of Indiana for their foresight in creating this monumental undertaking, and to Worshipful Brother Albert McClelland for his part in making this happen. It was with a mixture of delight and humility that I accepted the invitation to participate among all the Masonic luminaries. I must also express my thanks to Brother Chris Meadows, who is currently the junior warden of Withy Lodge in Leyland, close to here, for giving up his time and his expertise in recording, editing and polishing this presentation. You may, particularly if you've gone through the series thus far, wonder why there should be an item on the birth of a lodge. Well, not many of you will have had the privilege of being founders, and I suspect not too many of you will have had a chance to see an actual lodge consecration. However, that ceremony can be found in ritual books and is not a matter for discussion here other than in passing. But at the time of the recording, there is a debate which is going on on one of the internet research groups and the core of which is a particular phrase which is found in the installation ceremony in virtually the same form in virtually all the lodges that I'm aware of uh, around most of the English speaking world. The phrase is it is not in the power of any man or body of men to make innovations in the body of masonry. How far does this appear in the formation of Internet Lodge? Well, the consecration of Internet Lodge marked a key moment in the annals of Freemasonry, for it was a novel approach which made use of the latest technology to enable masons from all quarters of the globe to come together, communicate in real time, and enjoy their membership of a particular lodge. Wherever it may be, it was a novel approach to the craft. And the novelty was that it was the first time that modern technology should have been the reason for Masons worldwide actually to come together as members of the same lodge. Because of this, and the feeling that it was innovative, it attracted a fair amount of opposition. But, before getting to the specifics, I feel it's necessary to set the whole thing in context. And I apologise in advance if I'm going over familiar ground, but to understand the impact of the formation of Internet Lodge, the ideas of the founders, and the allegations that it attempted to push the envelope of established Freemasonry, even the suggestion that it attempted to make innovations, well, an outline of this should be established. United Grand Lodge of England, generally referred to now as the UGLE, is the senior Masonic body worldwide, and though all other uh, countries, or many other countries, have their own lodges, they all look to UGLE for recognition. So, a, an outline of established UGLE masonry may be helpful, and in the words of the Julie Andrews song, let's start at the very beginning. It's easy to forget that the concept of the internet is only a recent thing. After all, it was only some 15 years or so ago that the net was used only by military, government agencies and universities as a research tool. And very few individuals either had access or the finances to use the medium socially without access to these facilities. Naturally, those who use the net would venture in their spare moments into a general web search 
and locate items of particular interest. It's neither the time nor place to delve into a history of the internet or the World Wide Web, so I will content myself with observing that it was inevitable that friendship should spring up between those involved and this involved in this wonderful new electronic communication system and those of particular interest groups set up what are known as chat rooms. Many Freemasons managed to find each other and realised that physical distance was no bar to swapping tales, seeking information or conducting Masonic research. There was no bar on Lady Masons nor was there any obstacle for those in unrecognised lodges. After all, in the world of research, there are no boundaries as long as the material is appropriate and verifiable. Significantly, the established sources of Masonic research at the time were Quattro Coronati Lodge and its correspondence circle, and the uh, master of Quattro Coronati Lodge, uh, John Wade, actually gave the first lecture in this series. The other was, um, in America, was the Philalethes Society, both of which still flourish and were preeminent in the terms of Masonic research. They were, and still are, land-based organisations, so there's no need to be computerised to belong or to take part, although both have accepted and adopted electronic access. So, the arrival of an electronic means of communication where information could be transmitted in virtual real time was indeed a wonderful breakthrough. At the time, the social, as opposed to academic web, was mainly composed of what were known as mailing lists or discussion groups. Among the foremost of these was probably the best known was CompuServe Forum but a smaller and less formal group was Alt.Freemasonry, where many interesting and esoteric discussions take place. Indeed, one of the most knowledgeable Masonic scholars I have ever come across was a woman, and there was much surprise when she suddenly announced that she was about to be initiated into the craft, albeit into co-masonry. Browsing Alt-Freemasonry for there were moments of boredom in university research where one simply wanted something to refresh the mind, I realised that there were a few UK Masons on the list, and this number started growing. It was therefore no surprise when the suggestion was made that we meet up one day at the headquarters of UGLE in Great Queen Street, London. Not having met previously, and being before the days when it's commonplace to email photos of oneself, Various modes of recognition were established, a bow tie, a folded newspaper and the like. And on the 4th of July 1995, a dozen of us met up. The date was chosen because there was something special planned among the Masons in Boston, Massachusetts, and we wanted to send electronic greetings, something very novel, and would be done while embarking on a tour of the headquarters building. There, one or two of us were introduced to the newly appointed communications officer of United Grand Lodge, and he expressed a particular interest in masonry and the internet, and he sought enlightenment on it. It was a natural thing during our conversations, which stretched over lunch into the late afternoon in a nearby pub, it was a natural thing to suggest that we set up our own internet group, for UGLE and other British Masons and those with an affinity with or an interest in the craft in the United Kingdom. Thus, the UK Mason list was born and it has grown from that original dozen to over 1,300 at the time of recording, encompassing many different ranks and constitutions. It's a veritable fount of knowledge, providing answers to many obscure topics and questions on history and procedure. Soon it was decided to produce a pin, the E-Mason pin, to mark out members of this newfangled thing. In its original form, it comprised Masonic symbols that were not too overt and that would attract too much interest or become too obvious in their uh, appearance. 
but it attracted much interest from all and sundry, not just from masons, for those who wore it. If you were sufficiently eagle-eyed, you would have noticed the celestial and terrestrial globes, the seven stars, and the lightning streak across the middle symbolised electronic communication. A second version was produced, and that included a square and compasses, but this brought some displeasure among certain members, for in the United Kingdom, certainly at that time, overt displays of membership of the craft were frowned on, possibly also illustrated by the rings, finger signet rings with swivel faces, which actually showed a square and compasses when worn in the lodge, but could be swivelled to show merely a plain signet ring from outside the lodge. So interest in masonry on the, in the web was increased, as list members visited various lodges and also helped to spread the word of the new group. I suppose a logical consequence of this was that two of the original brethren engaging in, shall we say, a convivial chat very late one night in February 1996, came up with the idea of forming a lodge appropriate to the new technologies that were taking hold. They continued their musings for about a month and on Sunday the 10th of March put it on the UK Mason list with the fateful words, I don't think the world's ready for this yet, but less than two years later, Internet Lodge came into being. Before going any further, and appreciating that this may be well viewed by brethren who may not be familiar with, one, with our ways, I suppose I must risk a charge of teaching grandma to suck eggs. But because of the differences in both practice and ritual around the globe, and aware of the fact that this is going out to a large number of countries, it's felt necessary to give some brief explanation of United Grand Lodge of England Masonry, so you may appreciate the differences and better understand the subject matter. Speaking with the benefit of complete ignorance, it would appear that a significant difference in the practice here of the craft is that our Grand Master, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, is a fairly permanent fixture that the senior officers of Grand Lodge, UGLE, have a more or less indefinite tenure, and that appointments or honours come from above, and are not necessarily the result of campaigning at Grand Lodge meetings or of regular elections. That's not to say it's not unknown for certain brethren, and I use the word loosely, to crawl or otherwise inappropriately solicit honours which bring comments that honours are dependent on who you know or how much you give, rather than what you've done, allegedly. So, Grand Lodge is the supreme being in English and Welsh masonry. But, rather than many separate Grand Lodges in the USA, the system here operates through provincial or district Grand Lodges. So I suppose one could vaguely equate UGLE with Cogmina, but only vaguely. Each provincial Grand Lodge is presided over by a provincial Grand Master, appointed by the Grand Master. They usually serve for a term of seven years with a patent of appointment, and it's the provinces who control the individual lodges. Provincial honours are awarded uh, annually, except the Provincial Grand Master, his Deputy and Assistants, and the Provincial Secretary, who is appointed by the Provincial Grand Master anyhow. The rest of the Provincial team is appointed either with acting rank, which means formal duties throughout the season, or past rank, which for obvious reasons is the more common. The actual rank awarded creates a pecking order, which some find more significant than others and there's often a jockeying for position, while effectively, apart from one's place in a formal procession, me, the rank one gets really is meaningless. It should also be noted that the number of acting lodge officers may well differ in the United Grand Lodge lodges from those elsewhere, both in name and in function. In practice, a UGLA master is told that during his year, he is in charge, 
so long as he does as he's told. In effect, it means that the past masters have the knowledge and experience to see the lodge functions as it should. Of the significant officers, it should be said, without giving offence to some, that the secretary and director of ceremonies effectively run the lodge with the addition of the treasurer. The secretary deals with the general administration. The director of ceremonies is responsible for what happens at the meetings. It's a role unknown in some parts of the world, but involves planning the ceremonial, the running order, calling and supervising rehearsals, arranging substitute officers for those who can't be present, acting as or arranging as prompters as needed, deciding who will speak at the festive board, and generally keeping things moving in accordance with the lodge traditions. It's sometimes said that a DC is right even when he's wrong. This is an absolute calumny. A DC is never wrong. I guess who was the founding DC of Internet Lodge. However, in the course, in due course, the formulation of lodge offices will be dealt with. And this is merely to indicate that there may be some officers mentioned with whom you are unfamiliar. What's the significance of this? Well, in theory, each lodge is an individual entity which can determine how it works, always though under the Book of Constitutions of UGLE, of course. And it can conduct its after proceedings as it thinks fit. In practice, the province will dictate or persuasively argue how it wants a new lodge to function, both in terms of bylaws and, if it has its way, ritual. The anachronism here is that many new lodges are simply put spin-offs from larger, well-established lodges which want to carry on the traditions of their mother lodge, especially in ritualistic matters. Seemingly, another difference relates to what will be termed after proceedings, and particularly alcohol consumption. It is usual for UGLE lodges to have a meal, usually known as the festive board or social board, or to many of those in the States, the white table, and they have this after each regular meeting. Generally, it, forms a simple, it follows a simple formula of three courses, or three courses plus cheese and coffee, and it's a canteen-style meal, where there are a number of wine-takings and toasts. It's convivial and not too formal, except for installations when the meal becomes a banquet, in other words, an excuse to the caterer to charge considerably more for the provision of an extra course and probably candles on the tables. But the installations have a much more formalised structure. But at all these events, alcohol is served or sold. It may just be beer, but there may be wines and spirits too. However, it's almost unknown for anyone to become the worst for wear at these events. I acknowledge that in Scotland the after proceedings are limited usually to a sandwich and a drink, or just nothing, while in some English lodges uh, people are finding the costs rising disproportionately to the incomes of their members, so they are dispensing with a meal. This unfortunately has a knock-on effect for the halls, because there's a reliance on catering and bar profits to keep costs within due bounds. Most halls, or temples if you prefer, have a bar. The costs vary. Some are as cheap as they can be, while others take advantage of a captive audience to put their prices up. A publican, yes, they are allowed here, told me that he thought he had the most expensive bar in a certain large city, but the Masonic Hall was dearer. However, it's no disadvantage because when brethren arrive early for a rehearsal or a committee meeting, they can meet at the bar and have a chat while waiting for their meeting to start. Or they can even stay after a regular meeting for a digestif. But in any case, these strict drink drive, drink drive laws effectively restrict the alcohol intake, even though some complain it spoils their enjoyment prior to a long drive home. This highlights another significant difference in masonry on this side of the pond. UGLE lodges generally meet once a month or so many times a year. And for this, they have their regular meeting during the season. And the season is usually from September to May. 
Falling numbers, rising costs and demographic changes now mean rather than the old-fashioned nine meetings a year, although one or two lodges still meet every month. But lodges now meet three, four or five times, especially in the London area. Chapters, Mark, Royal Ark Mariners and other adjunctive orders tend to meet about three times a year. The meetings, which are open to all members, because here entered apprentices are members and have full voting rights. They only leave the lodge when it's open in a higher degree and return later. So the meetings consist of business matters, then a degree if there's a candidate, or a lecture, followed by the after proceedings. They don't meet weekly, but prospective candidates are told that if they join, they will be expected to attend rehearsals and lodge of instruction on another night in the month, and committee meetings where appropriate. But with membership of other bodies, a brother can find himself out three, four, five times a month, and even longer. Unfortunately, as foretold some ten years ago, membership numbers are decreasing. Lodges are failing and emerging or handing in their warrants, and many regular meetings are merely perfunctory affairs, with the possibility of a demonstration or rehearsal ceremony. A consequence of this is that reduced numbers of lodges and members mean that fewer appointments can be made. The number of assistant provincial grand masters is dependent on the number of lodges, and the number of provincial collars that can be awarded depends on the number of masons in any given group or district. This in turn leads to an unseemly spectacle of brethren crawling obsequiously in an attempt to secure what they consider a worthwhile appointment. The significance of this to Masonic historians? Well, it's not unknown for certain documents to vanish from lodge archives, especially if the subject matter is contentious. There are problems if minutes vanish, for a lodge has to prove continuous meeting to qualify for a 50th anniversary or a centenary, and this means having and showing a complete set of minutes. So a heartfelt plea, don't simply trash letters or documents which may indicate a significant event in your lodge's history, however unsavoury it may be. Hopefully you'll have an archive or somewhere to store them, Perhaps someone will transfer them to a CD or a zip drive. It may not interest you at present, but if your lodge survives, seek, uh, there may be those who in years to come seek the truth about the origins and history of the lodge. Don't feed them an incomplete fable. Compare the effect of the Da Vinci Code on masonry itself. And I say this having written the history of two lodges at least. It is common when reading lodge histories to find that the piece begins just with a short paragraph to the effect that there were so many founders who gathered on such and such a day for the consecration of XYZ Lodge. However, historians, and this is being to put together in the hope that Internet Lodge will survive for many years and somewhere in the distant future someone will try to record its history, Historians really like to search for the hidden truths, to discover what went on behind these glib cons consecration minutes and meeting minutes. Further, lodge histories just begin with the consecration itself, ignoring all the work which went into creating that moment. Consequently, this is an attempt to provide a warts and all scenario of the events which led from the early meetings of those who would become petitioners up to the moment when Internet Lodge formally came into existence. I've used the minutes of petitioners' meetings, which became founders' meetings later, together with primary source documentation, which passed between the petitioners, and also records of what, for want of a better word, technical meetings took place between, uh, usually in the provincial office, between a small number of the involved brethren. And since I was one of the main protagonists in the creation of the Lodge, I was present at all the relevant meetings, which is more than can be said for some who claim to have privileged knowledge. At this moment, 
I must indicate I have deliberately and generally left out ranks and titles and also minimised the number of names. There's nothing worse than sitting at a lecture where there's merely a succession of names of people who are unknown to most of those viewing. Um, so this is an attempt, however, to record events and not to glorify or denigrate individuals. Consequently, with very few exceptions, I've omitted the names, partly because I don't want to offend anyone with the sin of admission, however accidental it may be. The birth of Internet Lodge did not go as smoothly as many think. Indeed, there was significant hostility to the concept of the Lodge. Many obstacles were put in our way. Someone on high in Great Queen Street, that's you, GLE headquarters, picked up on a glib jocular comment that in keeping with the new technology, the Lodge would be opened by members in their own homes, clothing themselves in their regalia, sitting at their computers and logging on, more or less in the form of a video conference, which was the contemporary buzzword, and then hold a formal meeting. How any rational person could take this seriously beggars belief. But objection soon became apparent. Indeed, at least two of those interested in becoming founding founders received phone calls from senior brethren suggesting that continued attachment and interest in this new organisation would seriously affect their chances of future honours. Accordingly, much to their future chagrin, they withdrew. It's hard to quantify how much effort was put in by right worship for Brother David Law, the Provincial Grand Master of Derbyshire at the time, and very worshipful Brother John Cockin, the Deputy Provincial Grand Master of Oxford, and how much effort was put in at the Board of General Purposes, where they sat. They counted all falsehoods, corrected mis misconceptions, and expounded the virtues of this novel concept to good effect. Without them, it's doubtful that the Lodge would have come to fruition. And similarly, enormous gratitude is due to the Provincial Grand Master of East Lancashire at the time, Right Worshipful Brother James Dunsford Hemsley, who was on a special committee of Grand Lodge and talked directly to the Marquis of Northampton, the Assistant Grand Master at the time. And it was some of his work which allowed Internet Lodge to proceed. It was also as a result of this contact, contact that some of the earlier correspondence was directly with Grand Secretary himself, cutting out the red tape where everything had to go through the province. But it is now time to deal and detail some of the significant effects in our creation. Lodges don't appear overnight. There's an enormous amount of work to be undertaken, stretching over many months. And the idea of a lodge having been floated on the internet, a request was made then for interested parties to make themselves known. This was followed by a suggestion that those who wished to take office should indicate their willingness and their preference. Subsequently, the first of many meetings was arranged and a number of strangers gathered, firstly in a pub near Nutsford and then in the Midlands, to lay the foundations for this new enterprise. Meetings of what was to become the Petitioners Committee were held around the country, mainly in the Midlands as a geographical centre but as far apart as Essex and York. Contrary to further rumour, these were open to all interested parties, but the large amount of travelling involved by English standards, the need to rise early on a Sunday for a lunchtime meeting, and the realisation that one's made a trip in excess of 300 miles for a couple of hours' discussion which may have proved fruitless, curtailed the eventual number attending. However, in what may have been a groundbreaking action, minutes of all these meetings and any significant correspondence were circulated by email to all who wished to become petitioners. And they were given an opportunity to comment if they wished, so there could be no inference that they were kept in the dark. 
ultimately and innovatively, the large lodge summons and minutes were distributed electronically. Something totally unheard of then and suggested as a total innovation in masonry, but it's something which is now fairly commonplace. It's a case of Internet Lodge being at the forefront of Masonic progress, because I can't see innovation. Whatever was to happen, it was necessary to construct a framework for this new venture. For the Lodge as yet had no name, and there had been significant interest from abroad. So arrangements would have to be made to cater for those brethren, not least in selecting meeting time in order to enable those who were able to attend, but similarly had to be made available, there had to be some availability in whatever Masonic halls were to be used. And the inevitable clash of dates had to be taken into consideration. For the idea was that the lodge would be a travelling lodge. The place of installation, of installation would be fixed, but the other meetings would take place wherever the master at the time wished, if it was possible. But the requirements would always be that it had to be in a UGLE uh, meeting place. It was felt that a meeting on a Saturday at noon would be most beneficial, although it unfortunately meant that one or two Orthodox Jewish brethren then had to withdraw. There was also a feeling that at least one meeting should be held during the summer months, when overseas brethren might be vacationing in the United Kingdom, and thus gave them an opportunity to combine lodge attendance with their summer holiday. But it was always the intention that the lodge should be a service lodge meeting only infrequently in various locations and concentrating on matters of Masonic research and education rather than actually initiating candidates. Arising from this were two contentious proposals, both of which were flatly refused by Grand Lodge. Bearing in mind the hope that the Lodge would elicit much overseas interest and being conscious of the fact that many of those overseas brethren would be enabled to, or unwilling to travel to our meetings, yet would wish to have some connection, it was suggested the Lodge form an association, somewhat similar in concept to Quattro Coronati Correspondent Circle, QCCC. This would enable interested parties to have some sense of belonging without having to pay affiliation fees to UGLE in province, as well as normal Lodge subscriptions. They would have some form of research input and would be able to receive lodge papers. This was rejected out of hand without any opportunity to present a case or investigate how such a group, how such a group could be assimilated. Similarly, it was proposed that there should be a lodge orator as one of its officers, an opportunity to honor a distinguished Masonic researcher who would in turn present appropriate papers this too was rejected, although it was suggested that a steward could fulfil such a post, but there was no provision for a formal appointment to such an office. Now, strangely, the appointment of a provincial orator, and now grand orator, has been adopted. It must be remembered that initially there was a possibility that the new lodge would be part of either East Lancashire or Warwickshire province. In communication with Warwickshire, the Provincial Grand Master and the Provincial Secretary were not too happy with the idea of an internet lodge. And in any case, a new lodge, Thomas Harper Lodge, which specialised in members who collected Masonic jewels, had been formed there. So it was decided it would be East Lancashire. Don Hyde, the Secretary of the Petition, has recalled, it was Jimmy Hensley that cleared the link for me to talk directly with the Grand Secretary to get all the ideas set up. But then to make it all official, it had to be done via the East Lancashire Provincial Office. To be honest, if we hadn't used the old PALS Act, Internet Lodge would never have happened because at the beginning there was too much opposition to the idea from a number of provinces. And I understand that a deputation had actually been made to prevent its formation. It was Jimmy's belief in what I proposed to him that made him fight for us at Grand Lodge, 
and to persuade the powers that be that Internet Lodge could be a very forward way for masonry in the future. Consequently, all subsequent communications, requests and decisions were made and transmitted through the provincial office. There was no indication whether the source was UGLE or the province itself, but it was around this time that the competition for a lodge name took place. It took place on the net and our title was chosen. It was decided initially that the requirement for membership of the lodge was that one had to be on the internet and have an email address or access to an email address, whether it was a private address or your own address at a university or government department or whatever. It may have been serendipitous, but contrary to suggestions of the Manchester Mafia, the secretary to the petitioners, the future director of ceremonies and the future senior warden were all geographically close to the provincial headquarters in Bridge Street, Manchester. So were able to attend the many informal meetings requested by the provincial grand secretary and the provincial director of ceremonies. Here much of the nitty gritty of the future operations of the lodge was discussed and agreed. One thing that was demanded of us, and that was that we adopted Grand Lodge model bylaws in full. Then anything that we didn't like was to be submitted to the Grand Lodge for approval. There are about four points in these model bylaws which were changed and were approved by the Grand Secretary. There was also a persuasive request, I won't call it an instruction, that East Lancashire ritual, a form of emulation ritual, should be used uh, and that a copy should be submitted for province. Well, the only ritual submitted was a cod opening. According to the ritual of Ye Grandi Lodge of Middleton, which went through the process of booting up and logging on, unfortunately was received with the spirit intended. Much time and effort <coughs> actually went into creating the ritual. Not so much the words, but the rubric, the instructions regarding perambulations and protocol. In other words, everything else. It was carefully constructed to ensure a smooth flowing ceremony and accommodate members of different religions, as well as high ranking brethren from overseas constitutions and senior members of UGLE who might visit. <clears throat> All this had to be incorporated into our ritual and protocols including the procedures at the festive board, and it was thrashed out with discussions with the provincial director of ceremonies. It may have been subsequently amended, but initially it worked very, very well, although I admit it did have many West Lancashire overtones, but these were because experience had shown them to be worth adopting. Since the lodge officers would come from different provinces and have different ways of working, Care had to be taken to accommodate these differences in a manner which would not be too obvious to visitors. And similarly, a decision was taken to restrict wine takings and toast to our festive boards, at our festive boards, because remember this was a late lunch. And except for the installation, where depending on who attended, the full toast list and all the protocol would be observed. It should be mentioned that at this time, when people were invited to apply to take office, it was made clear that preference would be given to those who were experienced and had held those offices in their own lodges for quite some time. And particularly in the case of Treasurer, Secretary and Director of Ceremony, experience was very much needed. But it's easy to overlook the enormous amount of work undertaken by Worshipful Brother Don Hyde, the Secretary to the Petitioners, who spent many, many hours gathering essential information and putting it into a suitable form for committee meetings, not to mention liaising with the provincial office and overseas lodges. Most newly formed English lodges, using the term English advisedly, they're made up of local people. In this case, the membership was not only spread across the British Isles, 
but was extended to the four quarters of the globe. The logistics of gathering clearance certificates, membership applications from far distant parts, then, having ensured the applications were in order, devising a route to send the petition round for signature, arranging the final signatures to be appended in Manchester, this was beyond the ability of lesser men. Yet Dom performed these heroic tasks without complaint. He confirmed that, just for the record, I spent four years putting things together and in the last six months finished up working some six to eight hours every day. It's a pity his efforts were not recognised by those on high. But then he was not one of those who would crawl to get recognition. During this period, there was a fluidity among our members. While the UK Mason List, the grassroots of the new lodge, merely required an interest in UK Masonry, it was necessary for those wishing to become founders to join a UGLE lodge. Arrangements were made to expedite this, and although there was an influx, an influx of folk who seemed to be more interested in collecting lodges, than, and they dropped out by the wayside, it should be noted that once the lodge was in existence, membership application requirements were simply that they had to be a member of a recognised lodge. On election, an individual would become a member of UGLE, which possibly required a declaration in Open Lodge. A problem with this was that some of our new members were extremely high-ranking in their own jurisdictions, yet as members of UGLE Lodge, they were expected to wear a simple past master's apron. This even applied to our esteemed Turkish member, Jalil Liaktas, who was the representative of the United Grand Lodge to the Grand Lodge of Turkey. However, using nous of an experienced DC, it was expected, accepted that a brother coming as a representative of his own Grand Lodge was entitled to wear the regalia of that Grand Lodge. So in practice, a lot depended on the DC thinking on his feet, which introduces an important requirement laid down by the province. Initially, the requests on the UK Mason list parties indicate, to indicate willingness to take office, and a number of brethren gave such indication. However, quite correctly, province required those occupying the important offices, secretary, treasurer and DC, should be experienced in those posts. It may have proved a disappointment to some who aspire to these positions. At least one brother withdrew from the petitioners because he wouldn't be allowed to occupy one of those offices. But the logistics of getting the lodge off the ground and running smoothly required brethren who were sufficiently experienced to think on their feet and to make decisions rapidly. It was, however, decided by the petitioning committee, which had by this time become the founders committee, that nobody apart from the secretary or treasurer, and then only in difficult circumstances, should hold office for more than three years. This would give a chance for the new members to actually take office and was one of the traditions established from the outset. Perhaps the main custom established was there would be no ladder as such, following the pattern of many installed master's lodges. But the three founding principal officers having been selected, any member wishing to go into the chair should submit an online paper setting out his aims and aspirations during the year in office. These papers could be accessed by all the members. In the event of more than one application, a ballot would be taken online by the members and a winner declared. The successful candidate would be appointed junior warden of the subsequent installation and, detail and eventually progress into the chair. Details for the conduct of such a ballot were finalised and agreed. Similarly, it was assumed that most of the members would be active in their own jurisdictions and province was informed that we would not seek any provincial honours through East Lancashire. Seemingly, the wishes of the petitioners have now been overturned and not only have some been given collars, but I understand a double initiation ceremony was performed. 
There's nothing personal in the observation other than the fact that much time was taken by the petitioners to establish these principles, which to some seem to imply changes to the body of Freemasonry and that these changes have subsequently taken place, leaving some wondering what else may be altered. By this time, many details had to be resolved. There was a question of a lodge crest, which was again selected by consensus, and subsequently the provision of founders' jewels and regalia. Each officer was to provide the collar of his office and subsequently presented to the lodge. This was put in the capable hands of David Stower, who also presented the master's collar himself. Additionally, some provision was made for the same basic jewel that the founders would have as a founder's jewel, but the same jewel without the founder's bar to be available to the first batch of joining members. The formal design of the jewel was by Nigel Beaumont. A stainless steel tube to hold and transport the lodge warrant was made by the founding ADC, Mervyn Frank Wilson, who seemingly had visits from certain officers of a special branch, suspecting that this was part of the mysterious locking, rocket launching system because there was an almost to rock scandal at the time. It is strange that people talk about um, the pleasure of being founders of the Lodge and they don't realise that to become a founder actually is an expensive hobby because not only are you trekking around for meetings and things but you are expected to, pro uh, to pay for various things such as the cost of a Lodge warrant and various things involved in this consecration the provision of lodge regalia, lodge collars, and various impedimenta. So it can become a fairly expensive business which a lot of people don't realize. However, another difficult task was the creation of a consecration brochure. Difficult insofar as what was to be included and how it was to be put together. Once more, Don Hyde was faced with the time-consuming task and together with Charles Arnold eventually created a worthwhile souvenir document which contained the ceremony, a brief history and photographs of all the founders. Incidentally this was unusual because it was actually sent to a Southport Masonic printer, Roy Crawford, who wasn't involved with the lodge and he produced it but everything else connected with the lodge was done online and a lodge banner was actually produced and presented by one of our overseas brethren, Bob War, in the United States, who unfortunately passed to the Grand Lodge above shortly before the actual consecration took place. A scan of the brochure is to be found in the history photograph section of the Internet Lodge website for those who can gain access to it. So, on a fine morning in February 1997, some 40 petitioners arrived at Bridge Street, Manchester, many meeting for the same time. Thanks to name tags, it was possible to put faces to those names, which were only known online. And after an informal gathering with refreshments and another vocal appeal for prospective officers to make themselves known, everybody solemnly lined up and signed the petition. We all went to the Derby Room where the consecration was due to take place and where David Stirr took the face of first of what were to become a number of group photographs. A defining moment for Internet Lodge, though the photo was dark. These were also agreed, agreed with the new treasurer by the committee. And a formula for calculating individual meeting costs was created. Because the intention was to meet at noon, masonically symbolic, in order to allow for members to travel fairly long distances to attend, catering choice was important. It was felt that tea or coffee and biscuits should be provided before meetings for those who travel long journeys, and a suitable lunch menu should be selected. The difficulty was the provision of wine. Since many of those attending 
would be driving to and from the meetings, it was felt inappropriate to provide wine for all, including it in the meal costs. The exception, of course, was the consecration. When the founding of DC, who at the time had a share in the French vineyard, arranged for a supply of unlabeled red and white wine, which were collected by Brother Chris White from Boulogne, where it was delivered and produced a set of Chateau Internet Lodge labels. Now this wine was actually, which was actually a prize winning wine, which came from my vineyard, uh, the wine was actually served at the consecration banquet and every founder was presented with a full bottle to take home as a souvenir. Similarly, Rich Van Doren coming over from the USA presented every member with a Masonic shot glass. A logical problem was guessing how many would attend each meeting. It was a pretty foregone conclusion the consecration would be a full house and that the installations would attract larger than usual numbers. But what of the other meetings? Well, it was felt realistically that apart from overseas brethren taking in a meeting as part of a vacation, which is why one meeting was scheduled for summer, UK members would only really be prepared to travel up to about 50 miles for a meeting. Apart, of course, from the officers who were required, obviously, to be at all the meetings. This, in fact, proved a pretty accurate assessment, and the attendance at early meetings proved to be around 40 to 50. Another worthwhile innovation, which was tried at our early meetings, when at lunch there was only a small top table, and circular tables were set around for those attending. A lodge member was at each table, and they moved tables after each course, thus enabling the creation of new friendships. This lack of formality was to become a keynote of the lodge. There was no pecking order in the lodge room seating, except for the installation. Brethren sat wherever they fancied. There were no formal processions, apart from the master and officers at the opening. Wine takings were reduced to simply members of the lodge and all our guests. And the toast to absent brethren was given at 3 p.m., or as close as possible, which once again was when the clock hands were at a right angle. And the time was notified on the lodge website. So the meetings were planned to end early enough for brethren to catch trains or drive back and take, in time to take their partners out for the evening. Thus was Internet Lodge brought into being. It was by no means an easy birth, but the founders felt it was worthwhile. It's inevitable that the Lodge will eventually find its own traditions and form, and will probably move further from the hopes and aspirations of the founders than many would wish. This hopefully gives a flavour of the events which led up to the first years, and has been described in a more accurate manner, purely chronologically, by Alan Tibbetts in a paper that he produced for the Lodge members privately. However, in wrapping up, I don't want to seem churlish, but I must read you a section of the consecration brochure, which actually lists the aims and wishes of the founders, and these were that the Lodge will meet as a normal Masonic Lodge on dates specified in its bylaws, by dispensation in various venues. All members will have an email address. The Lodge aims to foster and encourage a wider and appropriate use of all means of electronic communication within Freemasonry in general. It will meet three times a year to receive papers by keynote speakers. Two of the meetings will be held in different locations to allow the members to meet to build a spirit of fraternity. The Lodge, while having some aspects of research type of Lodge, will concern itself not only with historical research, but also with matters of Masonic education and sociological trends in society as they affect Freemasonry today and in the future. Relevant contributions will be sought not only from members within the UGLA, but from around the world. How far these aims have been met and how far this has been deviation is up to the members to decide. 
but I hope this has given you a flavour of the background to the creation of a significant groundbreaking lodge. So, at 3.30pm on Thursday the 29th of January 1998, brethren assembled in the Derby Room of Freemasons Hall in Manchester were the Provincial Grand Master for East Lancashire. But that is another story. I wish you well.